Hello, everyone, and welcome to Virtual Planetarium Exploring Space, part of our MOS at Home programming. My name is Janine, my pronouns are she and her, and I'll be your moderator today. That means I'll be reading some of your questions and responses, which you can submit below using the Q&A button here at, in the Zoom meeting. It'll be at the bottom of your screen. If you'd like to see captions during today's program, you can click on the closed captions button at the bottom of your screen and select show subtitles. And if you're joining us on Facebook or YouTube, we're so excited you're joining us, but unfortunately I'm unable to see your responses at this time. We're so delighted to have you all here today as our audience. Let's meet our flight crew for today's journey. Hello everybody, my name is Talia. I use she, her pronouns and I'm going to be your presenter today, which means I am going to be doing a lot of talking, but all I will be doing is the talking. To make this a complete presentation, I need a little help. Hi everyone, my name's Katie. My pronouns are she and her, and I will be your pilot today, which means I'm going to fly us around a little bit and provide some pretty cool visuals. And today what we're going to be talking about are spacecraft trajectories. And you might be wondering, what does the word trajectory mean? It is the path that a spacecraft takes to get from point A, which is usually Earth, but not always, to point B, which could be another planet, it could be a moon, it could be an asteroid, however it's going to get where it is meant to be going to carry out its mission. That is called its trajectory. And you might assume that it would just be a straight line between point A and point B, but that is really not the case. In fact, there's a lot of work that has to happen after a rocket launches. So um, Katie, what we're looking at right now is a blank screen, there we go. And so once you get the spacecraft to the launch pad, the work is not done. Getting your spacecraft into space is in fact a huge deal, a pretty difficult part of the mission, but the tricky stuff doesn't stop once you get into space. If you want your spacecraft to get where it is going, things are often a little more complicated than you would expect. So take for example, an example here, trying to get from Earth to Mercury. Mercury is a pretty nearby planet. You would think it would be a very nice, easy straight line mission, but the trajectory to get a spacecraft to Mercury is actually a lot longer takes a lot more time and involves this long spinning spirally path in towards um, the target, which in this case is Mercury. What we're looking at here is the actual trajectory of a spacecraft, which was named Messenger, it was um, a spacecraft that we put in orbit around Mercury. And we're gonna be talking a bit about Messenger along the way during today's presentation. So, what is going on there? Why, even though Mercury is a relatively nearby planet, it's a pretty short distance away, why did the spacecraft have to take this extremely long, looping, spirally path in order to get there? Well, it has to do with the way, you're, if you're going to get spacecraft anywhere in space, you can, you can send them direct. You can send them from point A to point B. But if you're going to do that, you're going to pay a cost, either in time or fuel. Time can mean that it could take decades for your spacecraft to reach its destination. And fuel would mean that it would take a whole lot of fuel in order to get your spacecraft where you want it to go in a timely fashion. So can anybody think of a reason why we don't just do that? If we could get spacecraft where we want them to go a lot faster, if we just gave them more fuel, why don't we just do that? Can anybody think of a reason? And you can go ahead and put your answers in the Q&A. Uh, and if you're not sure, you can always put question marks. We have one answer coming in that says it's too expensive. Pretty much it. So, yeah. and we also have one from Jordan who says the cost, and Pranav says it would get too heavy to fly. Yeah. So the 
it really comes down to cost. Unfortunately, as much as we would like science and physics to be the only thing that drive our spacecraft missions, cost is a factor and getting things into space is expensive. So if we take a look, if we take an example, that same mission that we were just talking about, Messenger, the Messenger spacecraft carried with it um, just over 1,300 pounds of propellant, of fuel. And the propellant itself wasn't that expensive. It costs about $300 per gallon, which is of course way more expensive than it, the fuel you use in your car, but it is, you know, spacecraft fuel. So it costs about $48,000 to fuel up Messenger. It then costs $13 million to get all that fuel into space. The cost of launching the spacecraft is a huge part of the cost of any space mission. And launching more fuel is extremely expensive. So yes, you could in fact launch your spacecraft, give it a ton of fuel and allow it to shoot its way directly where it wants to, where you want it to go with a lot of fuel and you are going to not be able to pay for your mission. It's just going to be way too expensive. So we can't take the straight path usually. There are places we can. Um, but usually we need to do something else if we don't want to pay the time cost. So we could, again, send things directly there and spend decades waiting for them to get there. Or we can do something else to change the speed of the spacecraft. And this is a thing that we call a gravity assist. Now it's kind of a bad term for it because gravity assist makes it sound like gravity is really doing the work. What's happening in a gravity assist is actually a momentum transfer. And we can uh, think about it. Let's pause the video for a moment, Katie, before we start talking about our earth example. Momentum comes whenever something that has mass, which can be a person, it can be a baseball, it can be a car, or it can be a planet. Anything that has mass is moving, has velocity, it has momentum. The greater the mass and the greater the velocity, the more momentum it has. So what happens during a gravity assist is a spacecraft actually uh, has an encounter with usually a planet and either gives up some of its momentum or steals some of the planet's momentum to change its own speed. So what we're going to show you right now is an Earth-based example, which we actually, uh, we teamed up with a local roller derby team, the Charles Hayden Planetarium teamed up with a ro local roller derby team to film this example. And to start with, we are gonna have Skater One, who is the one you can see in the middle of the screen. And I'll get rid of my face so that you can see it better. Skater One is in the middle of the screen and she would kind of represent the planet. And her fellow uh, skaters who are going to be zipping past her, they're kind of representing the spacecraft in this. So to start with, we're gonna see what would happen if Skater One, the one who represents the planet, is just holding still. So let's go ahead and play. You can see she pulls her teammates around her and their direction changes, but they're pretty much going the same speed. Their direction has altered, which is what happens when a spacecraft flies by a planet, but their speed really hasn't changed. It's because Skater 1 isn't moving. She doesn't have any momentum that she could transfer. But what happens when she is moving? If you do the same maneuver, but she's skater one is moving, she winds up transferring almost all of her momentum to her teammate. She stops moving and her teammate goes way faster. The teammate's speed increases dramatically. This is because there's a momentum transfer happening. So skater one is actually giving up her own momentum transferring it through her arms to her teammate. And it has the effect that she actually is not moving anymore. So this is a similar to what is happening with a spacecraft that does a gravity assist, except Skater 1 is a human mass and she wasn't moving that fast. She only had some momentum to transfer. 
That is not the case when you're talking about planets. So let's say, for instance, uh, you want to calculate the momentum of a planet. Remember, it's mass and velocity which determine your momentum. And planets, of course, are very massive objects. Some of them are extremely massive objects. And although we don't think of planets moving that fast, they actually are moving very quickly, thousands of miles an hour in their orbit around the sun. So they are very massive objects. They are moving very, very quickly. They have a lot of momentum. Now, maybe before we start talking about um, how it looks when a spacecraft does this sort of interaction with a planet. Janine, have any questions popped up maybe about our Earth-based example? Um, not any questions that I see here. Okay, good. So we'll move on and we will talk about what happens then when we're not talking about human masses moving at human speeds on Earth, when we're talking about a spacecraft and a planet. So we use, a, as our example, a, a real mission, which was the New Horizons mission. So let's go ahead and start that video. So here are, is a diagram of the solar system. And again, the mission that we are going to be using here to sort of use as our example is um, the New Horizons mission, which was a real space mission. It left Earth in 2006, and its mission was to fly past Pluto. Now, when it launched in 2006, it was actually the fastest spacecraft that we ever launched. But if it had gone directly to Pluto, it would have taken it 12 years to get there. That's still ridiculously fast as spacecraft go, but 12 years is a long time. And if we don't have to wait that long, why bother? So when they launched New Horizons, they didn't launch it towards Pluto. They launched it towards Jupiter. Jupiter is extremely massive and is actually moving very, very quickly through space, which means it has a mind erasingly large amount of momentum. So what happened is we sent New Horizon to steal some of that momentum with a gravity assist. So New Horizons actually launched uh, in 2006 and headed directly for Jupiter, which it reached about a year later. So it was moving pretty quickly. And this encounter with Jupiter both bent its path uh, like you saw with the skaters and caused some of Jupiter's momentum to be transferred from the planet to the spacecraft and dramatically sped up the spacecraft. So New Horizons actually reached Pluto in nine years instead of 12. It cut three years off of the trip just by, and it was free, free, free speed essentially. We didn't pay any extra cost to get it moving that fast. And that is the beauty of a gravity assist. You're just essentially getting free momentum. And you might be saying, well, shoot, that means Jupiter has less momentum. Did it slow down? You have to remember that Jupiter has so much momentum that the tiny, tiny, tiny amount that got transferred to the spacecraft really did not make a difference to the planet. The planet, yes, there was technically momentum loss. The planet, trust me, did not notice it. But New Horizons, which, you know, even though it was moving pretty quickly, doesn't have a lot of mass. That little bit of momentum that Jupiter gave up that got transferred to the spacecraft resulted in a huge change in speed. And you'll notice it also did bend the path. So the gravity of the planet actually will cause the spacecraft's path to be slightly altered. And this is where you've got to be very, very careful when you're planning these gravity assists. So it went from, for instance, it went from, all right, we've got a spacecraft, it's on Earth, we want it to get to Pluto. So we just need to figure out where Pluto's going to be in 12 years, and that's where we aim the spacecraft. It went from that to, okay, we want the spacecraft to get to Pluto. 
but we need it to encounter Jupiter first. So first you had to figure out how to get it to Jupiter. And then you had to figure out exactly what angle to get it to have it approach Jupiter so that the path would bend just the right amount so that New Horizons would be aimed at where Pluto would be eight years later. So gravity assists really uh, increase the amount of math that you have to do if you want to get your spacecraft where it's going. But it is free momentum. It knocked three years off of the New Horizons mission and made it possible for the spacecraft to arrive in 2015 instead of 2018, which was great because that, meant, that means in the intervening time, New Horizons is still moving quickly. It's heading out into the Kuiper Belt. It's taking images of Kuiper Belt objects. So it has maintained that momentum, which is great. It means we're getting to explore a new area of the solar system. So that is one way that a gravity assist can happen. Before I move on to the other way, Janine, any questions that have popped up that I should try and answer? Oh, absolutely. Coco wants to know, why doesn't the planet or moon pull the spacecraft into orbit during a gravity assist? That is an excellent question. And it almost starts to. That's actually why the path bends. It's almost like the spacecraft is beginning to enter an orbit, but it's moving too quickly. It's at escape velocity, which means that while the spacecraft's path will get bent, it will not be captured. It will it has enough energy, enough speed to keep going out of the planet's gravity. If New Horizons had been moving slower when it reached Jupiter, it would have entered orbit. So we also needed to make sure that New Horizons was moving fast enough when it reached Jupiter to not fall into orbit around it, because then it would have been a Jupiter mission instead of a Pluto mission, which would be cool, but not what we were going for. And Chloe wants to know, did the team have to figure out exact timing to get that perfect spot near Jupiter? It's pretty exact. It's not down to the second, but you do need to know within, it's I think in less within less than an hour, you need to be able to calculate that out years in advance. So you do need to do some pretty precise calculations and they do tend to calculate it down to the second. So uh, there, you, there's a little bit of wiggle room for error because the spacecraft does have some propellant on board so it can adjust its course a little bit, but you really need to come out of that gravity assist heading pretty much in the right direction or you could be in a lot of trouble. And then I like this question from Riley. What happens when an asteroid crashes on, into a planet? Who got the momentum? That's a great question. Uh, in that case, the momentum of the asteroid would be transferred into the planet. The planet would absorb it. Um, but again, mostly they're, the things that are floating out there are not uh, large enough, not moving fast enough, not massive enough to dramatically affect the momentum of planets. Planets are very, 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 very massive and moving very quickly. So changes to momentum don't bother them much which is good because again, the spacecraft is stealing, in that case, the spacecraft was stealing momentum from the planet. But there is another way that gravity assists can happen and it has the opposite effect. So the one we just looked at, the spacecraft approach sort of behind the planet, stole some of the planet's momentum and sped up dramatically. But there's another way that gravity assist can happen. If the spacecraft actually sort of comes at the planet from head on, a little bit more from the front, then the opposite actually happens. A momentum transfer still occurs, but this time the spacecraft's momentum is transferred to the planet and the spacecraft actually slows down. That bend in the path, the bend in the trajectory still happens, but this time the spacecraft has given up momentum instead of gained it. So the case for speeding your planet up or speeding your spacecraft up, that's pretty obvious why you might wanna do that. Can anybody think why you might want to slow a spacecraft down instead? Go ahead and put your answers or what you think might be an answer in the Q&A. You can, of course, always put question marks. Why might you choose to give up momentum? 
instead of taking it. Um, so there's an answer from Regina, maybe before landing or approaching the planet to land, uh, or maybe to enter into orbit from Pranav. Um, and Jordan, age nine, says maybe if it's coming back to Earth. These are all good answers. And it is true that when we are um, approaching a planet that we want to go into orbit around, we don't want their spacecraft to be moving too quickly. I should note, by the way, that the same thing holds true that even though the planet has gained some momentum in that case, the planet didn't notice. It was such a tiny amount compared to the planet's overall momentum. But yeah, there are reasons we might want to slow a spacecraft down. And it really has to mostly do with if we want to look at the inner solar system. So Katie's got a diagram here of the inner solar system. And let's say again, you wanted to launch something from Earth towards Mercury. Well, you are also launching it not just towards Mercury, you're orbiting, you're launching it towards something else as well, the sun. The sun's gravity is going to make your spacecraft speed increase. It's going to make your spacecraft move faster and faster and faster. And that's no good if you want your spacecraft to go into orbit. So if you remember that first spacecraft trajectory we saw in that first video, the one that was swooping and swirling around the inner solar system, that was a messenger spacecraft, which we sent to Mercury. And we had to slow it down before it could enter orbit around Mercury. So it spiraled around the inner solar system, uh, having uh, gravity assists with Mercury, Venus, and Mars, or Ver Mercury, Venus, and Earth, each time giving up some of its speed until the time that it arrived at Mercury and was moving slow enough that it was able to enter orbit. So that is why you want to slow a spacecraft down. And it also brings up sort of the next thing I really want to talk about, which is the New Horizons example was pretty basic. There was only a single gravity assist, just the one at Jupiter. But that is frequently not the case. Very often, if you have a spacecraft that you want to send out into space, you're going to need to use multiple gravity assists to get it where you want it to go. And to start with this, I'll show you the, or Katie will show you the uh, picture of the trajectory followed by my favorite spacecraft of all time, the Cassini spacecraft. Cassini launched from Earth in 2004 and it flew by Venus twice, Earth once, and Jupiter once in order to reach Saturn. Sorry, it launched in 1997. It, took seven years to reach Saturn because it had to do all of these gravity assists around the inner solar system to pick up the speed it needed to get to Saturn. And that means that the people planning this mission didn't just have to know the positions of Earth and Saturn, they also had to know the positions of Venus on two different dates and the position of Jupiter. You wouldn't think to send a spacecraft to Saturn, you'd need to keep track of where Venus is, but we very much did. And this is what gave this spacecraft enough momentum, enough speed to get out of the inner solar system and reach Saturn in only seven years. And again, if you're going to go towards the inner solar system, you're gonna to need to slow down a lot. So let's look at the full trajectory for the messenger spacecraft. This one was pretty impressive. It took six and a half years to get from Earth to Mercury, even though that's a very short distance between planets. Those two planets are never very far apart. But it took six and a half years because it had to do gra gravity assist where it gave up momentum once by Earth, twice by Venus, and three times by Mercury itself before it could finally be slow enough to approach Mercury and go into orbit around it. So gravity assists are very handy for speeding your spacecraft up. They are very handy for slowing your spacecraft down without having to use up a whole ton of fuel. But there's one other kind of 
fringe benefit to them. And that is it actually lets your spacecraft visit several destinations along the way. And very frequently, uh, for instance, when New Horizons flew by Jupiter, it used that as a chance to sort of test all its cameras and instruments. But sometimes visiting multiple destinations is actually the point. One of NASA's most famous and one of its most ambitious space missions ever launched were the Voyagers, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. And they left Earth in 1977 and they toured the outer solar system. Voyager 2 actually flew past all four of the gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune over a, a course of 12 years. Voyager 1 only flew past Jupiter and Saturn, but it was some of our, some of a the first really good images we got of those outer worlds. Now these guys kept on going. They never were intended to go into orbit around anything. So nobody cared that they were going faster and faster after every single gravity assist. And that means they're on their way out of the solar system. In fact, if we go and see what it looks like if we were on Voyager 2, it's way, way, way out there. We, it is getting farther and farther from its origins every day. It's actually in interstellar space at this point. So, and it couldn't have done that without gravity assists. It would never have made it that far. So um, I hope that uh, I've given a good idea of just how complicated it can be to get a spacecraft from one place to another in the solar system. You need to know the locations of all sorts of places in the solar system along the way, even if it's not actually where you want to go. But that's how you can get your spacecraft where you want it in a reasonable amount of time without having to break the bank to provide it with fuel. I think we still have a couple of minutes left, Janine. Are there any questions I can answer before we're done? Yeah, I think we have time for maybe one or two questions. I like this question. Um, while this is making my head spin, it's great. Thumbs up. What kind of math is used? Is it calculus, et cetera? It's, uh, it's actually not too complicated um, in terms of determining how much speed a spacecraft can pick up from a gravity assist. You really only need two equations. Um, you need one that talks about the gravitational potential energy of the planet and one that talks about the kinetic energy of the spacecraft. You just need to balance those two equations to figure out how much speed you can pick up by passing your planet, by passing the planet. And then um, from there, it's a little more complicated if you want to, to do uh, figuring out where the planets all are, but the actual math for the gravity assist is pretty simple. Uh, it is very basic calculus, so. All right, and um, there's a question about, can New Horizons get back to Earth? It can't, it's going too fast. Again, it was never intended to come back, so we didn't bother trying to ever slow it down. And it was never intended to go into orbit around Pluto either. Katie's zooming us in on New Horizons. Uh, it was always intended to fly past Pluto and take images and data on its way past, which means we kind of didn't care how fast it was going and it's going way too fast for us to slow it down and turn it around. That would take another huge amount of fuel that New Horizons does not have. So it's continuing out into the Kuiper Belt, exploring this unexplored region of the solar system instead. Well, thank you so much, my, my glowing face as my camera adjusts to uh, the lighting in here. Thank you so much for teaching us all about gravity assists and perhaps we should call them momentum transfer. Uh, Something more accurate. Something like that. Thanks to both of you guys. I'll let you say goodbye. Bye everybody. Bye everyone. And thank you to all of you for joining us today for asking really good questions. Um, I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them, but we do talk about space about twice a week. So keep an eye out on our social media channels or check out www.mos.org slash MOS at home to see what programming is coming up.
If you enjoyed today's presentation and would like to support more programming like this, please visit engage.mos.org slash welcome to support MOS at home. Uh, some of today's program was produced using the free software NASA's Eyes, which you can find at eyes.nasa.gov. Thank you all for joining us today, and we hope we'll see you again soon. Bye.